Hi, I'm Tim. This is Watchbox Studios, and you are watching Watches Tonight. We've got Nick and Sean on the switcher this evening. We are talking watches and wonders predictions. Last call, one watch collections. If you're going to have one watch, what is that watch? I have suggestions. We chat live and viewer wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. Live in the box, Enrique Cassiano, Soma R, Edward Ledden from Sweden, Arto Shaw from New York City, Thomas Burnett, Christopher H, Richard Combs from South Florida. Richard, you got a wrist shot in Tonight, CLF, Jay Parmesan, happy to be in here on this Eclipse Day. Mateo C, Slow Boy, Sean Hansen, Karate Chop, Horology Homies from Garden City, New York. Welcome to all of you. Okay, I asked you answered. We're starting you off with some wrist shots. A few yours on mine. Michael K leads off with his Debitun DP28 kind of blue. A peg in the meter. Hard to top. And chilling down in Florida at Lester's Diner in good taste on every level. One lucky guy showcases his H. Moser and C. Streamliner small seconds blue enamel at our California event at Hyde Park Jewelers. Richard Combs, he's in the box now, he's on your screen, proves that the titanium Rolex Yacht Master does exist. We also have Christopher H., who puts a ring on it and celebrates by loaning his Alango Unzona 1815 to his new fiancé. Congratulations to both of you. Zachary V. just floors me with this killer H. Moser and C. Endeavor Perpetual Tantalum Blue Enamel, my favorite Moser of all time, and you've got it in class, and here I sit with none. Class in more senses than one right there. He's in class and he has class. All right, Baltimore Spirits, definitely check his wares. He makes good stuff. Time Hill from Virginia. Chitanya, we've got you on the wrist shot slot. We got Celine Driver from Sarasota, Florida. CLF, GMT Master 2 Pepsi on his wrist. We got 2-9 getting up early from Sydney. And we've got Horology Homies saying some Rolex already leaking, Tim. That's true. More interesting to me, some JLC Duomet updates actually leaking. Check out Watch Pro site right now. They've actually got some really good looking shots of the new stuff. The Duomet was always the definitive JLC for complications, guys. Looks like it's getting a makeover. What else is going on? We've got Minibus 1351 from Chicago. Steven Robinson from Liverpool staying up late with us. Aaron W. staying up even later in Germany. And we've got Gorkum. G. Hi, Tim. Hi, Gorkum. Good to see you there. Zachary Weaver from Richmond, Virginia. Welcome, dudes. Okay, Philip Salmon, thank you for making our live show. I always appreciate that. So, Watches and Wonders 2024, what will we see? I've got a couple of guesses right here. Let's start with something that would be spectacular and isn't completely impossible. Tudor, considering this, does a Daytona tribute. Now, follow me here. Rolex won't do a 39 millimeter manual wind pump pusher with a plexiglass crystal. And in fact, that original Daytona was more like a 37. But you know what? Tudor will do this. Tudor absolutely will, because Tudor has become the source for Rolex retro watches. Consider this Tudor has done a Pepsi GMT tribute and a Pan Am dial version of that Pepsi GMT tribute, and a 1655 Explorer II tribute as well. Rolex won't make a vintage retro style rivet bracelet Explorer II tribute, but guess what? Tudor did it. So could a Cosmograph in all but name be next, maybe reviving the Fast Rider nomenclature previously used on modern Tudor chronos? Maybe cause, calling it something like a I don't know, Tudor Heritage Chrono Exotic Dial with a revival of the Singer Exotic Dial, better known as the Paul Newman. It would be very, very cool. It would give Tudor a much needed chronograph that's not part of the Black Bay line and frankly, a line extension beyond the Black Bays. We need to give the Black Bay a little bit of a rest and I think this would be a great way to do it. Build out the Fast Rider line, build out the Heritage Chrono line and I think that's really where this kind of watch would sit. I don't think it would be a 37 like the original Daytona, but I do think it would be about a 39, which would be perfect. And it could have either a plexi or a sapphire-like 
well, just think about it, like a bubble glass box sapphire, like the new Tag Heuer Carreras, that looks like a plexiglass. This would be super cool. This would be a manual wind, and it's very possible that this could happen. Consider that Tudor has access to Breitling's chronograph calibers. That's what you find in a Black Bay chronograph. It's the Breitling B01. We'll grab the B09 version of it from the 1959 Navitimer re-edition, because that one is a triple register manual wind chrono. Now you've got a 39 millimeter case, a bubble sapphire or plexi, I'd love to see it, a manual wind chronograph, and pump pushers. Now Artisan de Genève might do something like that, but Rolex certainly won't. Tudor, though, seems to have the license to pay homage to vintage Rolex, and I think this would be a really, really cool way to do it. Okay. So, considering that a Tudor Daytona could be on the way in just a week's time, let's consider another revival, this one under the original brand name. By the way, let me see what you guys are saying right here. We have Renside tuning in from the path of totality. Interesting. We have Karate Chop. Where can I find leaks on ProSite? Just go to watchprosite.com and go to the Jager LeCoult section and you'll be able to see the new Duomet. We got Mr. Tack joining in. Tack on Wong. Hi all. Hi Tack. Good to see you. Philip C. Tomorrow is a young Christmas for adults. Caliber YQG. Yes, we need a new Tudor Heritage Advisor would be great. Also would love a Titanium North Flag. I would love to see a smaller Tudor Heritage Advisor. I think the only thing wrong with the 2011 version was that it was just too big. And we have Mike David saying, Rolex releases are a shambles. Well, hold your fire there. We don't know that yet. They've been pretty weird in recent years with a lot of things like emoji dials, celebration dials, and titanium yacht masters that very few people saw coming. So give them a chance. Aaron W saying, I would love a 37 millimeter vintage Tudor Daytona. And we got Anthony Lutz finally catching Tim live from the Motor City. You know I love American Iron. I'm with you, my man. Okay, so a vintage reissue, maybe in name, maybe not exactly in design, but how about Patek Philippe launching an engineer's watch? Once upon a time, it happened. In 1958 with the 3417, there was also a precious metal version. This was a watch like the Milgauss, the Railmaster, the Ingenieur, the JLC Geophysic. It came out in the golden era of technicians and engineers' watches. The caliber 27AM400 was gorgeous and cost no object. Geneva seal, five position adjustment, hand finished to the nth degree, free sprung gyromax balance, blued overcoil hairspring, and anti-magnetic to one thousand gauss. It was a Patek movement with all that implies, but it was also hardened against magnetism and thus more versatile. There's also a even more intriguing and lower production lugless 3418 version of the A magnetic. Now it doesn't say it on the dial, but mechanically it had the same hardware under the hood with an integrated mesh bracelet. This is one that Goffberg had at one point. Think about what that would do to the internet. Could this be one outlet for Patek's expanding use of steel now that the steel 5711 and 5811 for that matter doesn't exist? I think Patek does pull liberally from its history and it would be really cool to see a steel anti-magnetic Patek dress watch today or maybe even a quasi all-arounder. Think about 100 meters water resistant, luminescent, automatic winding, lugless with a full mesh bracelet. That would be a viable sports watch, something you could also wear all the time. You could wear it with formal attire. You could wear it with short sleeves. It's something, given lugless construction, if it's like the 3418, it's something that even a small wrist or a woman could wear, so it would have unisex appeal. Let's look at how Patek is pulled from its history. Now, the 5320G that came out in 2017, that was an homage to the 1591, a very, very true one right down to the syringe hands and the font, the numerals. There was also the 5236P, the inline calendar. Don't look at the dial, look at the case, which references the 3448, and you can see it is the spit and image. So Patek does look back, not in anger, but wistfully, and I think we could see a revival 
of the amagnetic technician's watch to fill out the sports watch and fill out the stainless steel production while the steel core nautilus is on hiatus. Now we could also see a revival by the way, we've got CLF saying Rolex releases got leaked. Now guys, obviously you know my ability to discuss this topic is constrained for now. So I'm gonna refer you to all of those sites where you look for news. And unfortunately it is not something I can address directly yet, but watch this space. Okay, a uh, quick note, what if Rolex launches a Dato Compax? Now I haven't seen anything that they might be making. I haven't seen any leaks. It would be fun though. There's a 6036, the Jean-Claude Killy, triple calendar and a chronograph in an oyster case. Remember, the Sky Dweller already has an annual calendar mechanism. Can you imagine a fusion of this and a Daytona, both within the same case? I think I would just about drop dead. Well, I normally don't get too excited about Rolex releases, that would be something genuinely adventurous, and it would be one for the complication guys like me, and I'm sure like you. All right, Vacheron expands the overseas line. The late great brown dial, no one bought it, now everyone wants it. They command a huge premium, but we're not here to talk about the brown dial. There's room to expand the current overseas chronograph collection and portfolio. So Vacheron already does an overseas chrono, a dual time, a retrograde, a tourbillon, and a perpetual calendar. But Vacheron also has a split seconds peripheral rotor automatic chrono ready to go in that caliber 3500 you see right there. How about a split seconds chronograph in the overseas line? Do I have your attention? Now granted, it would cost a lot more money, probably pegging the meter at over six figures, but with constrained production and, well, sufficient quality of finish and design, this could be something that is Vacheron's response, not just to Audemars Piguet and Patek, but to the likes of Grubel and Richard Mille and the ultra haute de gamme in the independent space. This could put Vacheron on a different plane. Now it's already doing business, this movement right here, in the Harmony and the Traditionnel lines. You could see that it's already been deployed. It's a twin register split second with a power reserve on the dial. It is a very well balanced, sort of vintage evocative dial side aesthetic. Now this movement, caliber 3500, there's a lot to love. First, peripheral rotors are still elite and rare. They're special because they give you automatic winding, but with the big open display back vista you would get with a manual wind and the thin profile you would get with a manual wind. Now take a look here, this is a big movement. 37.66 millimeters by 5.2 thick, so it's thin but it's broad. It would fit beautifully inside a 42 millimeter overseas chronograph case. And it has twin column wheels, each with a Vacheron Maltese cross. They're about they're at about 4 o'clock and 11 o'clock as you look at that movement. It has a lateral clutch, beautifully traditional, including a pincer system for the split second. 48 hour power reserve, there is that power reserve indicator on the dial side. Geneva Hallmark, every piece exhaustively finished. Five position adjustment and again, 5.2 millimeters thick. And consider something like a 7750, which is 7.9 millimeters thick, or a Blancpain Frédéric Piguet 1185, which is only 5.5 millimeters thick. This is thinner than that. Very impressive hardware, and I'm looking forward to seeing it in an overseas split second. So the Vacheron Overseas Chrono has competition from Patek Philippe and Audemars Piguet, but a true split second chronograph in this league would really have only one rival, a manual wind monopusher retropant from FP Journ. And that one again is manual wind. The Vacheron is an automatic. Now in my dreams, this overseas split second would revisit some of the 2007 Japanese market engine magazine limited edition. It was a 50 piece limited edition that had a lot of automotive themes, including dashboard instrument like scales. If we go back to the prior photo, you might be able to see that the dial is also made of carbon fiber, which is very, very sporty for a Vacheron. And that classic sporting tritone of black, white, and red that you'll find on so many great 50s, 60s, and 70s motorsports chronos. And you can see the off-centered automotive-like 
calibration on the minute and hour registers of the chrono. I would love to see that paired up with the split seconds movement. Please, Vashron, I know it's too late, but indulge me. Next year, the year after, please make this happen. Okay, Edward said, Rolex GMT with full blue bezel, question mark. Could it be that the service special blueberry bezel from the 1970s gets resurrected officially? I don't know. It's a possibility. Would I like to see it? You better believe. What else is going on here? David Rima saying, I'd like a mid-size overseas that's not an insult to collectors like last year's 34.5 millimeter model with the tiny non-Geneva seal movement. I'm all about that. Ideally, I would like something the size of the original 37 millimeter men's overseas from the 90s, from 1996, complete with COSC chronometer certification. Okay, so lean driver. I'd like your opinion, Tim. I'm taking a trip to Venice. Was thinking my Breitling Gen 1 emergency would make a good travel companion what say you uh, maybe know the city know the lay of the land know how customs might react to something so prominent if they don't believe that it is yours you might have to declare it coming in and going out I don't know what that would involve also I'm not sure if you're on the Venetian lagoon portion of the city you're probably fine but I don't know what crime is like in Italy these days and if you are on the land side of things uh, you might want to scout in advance I think you can never go wrong with a swatch but if you want to bring a luxury watch I would bring something a little bit I, I guess if you got a gen 1 emergency you're probably okay it's still a gnarly crazy looking watch I would say flat out no on the emergency too but on a gen 1 Probably. It's not a bad travel companion. I still say overseas, you go with something a little bit lower profile. Maybe check the rest of the collection and see if you've got something with a bit more discretion inherent. We got Jay Parmesan saying that peripheral rotor is easily one of the coolest things I've seen. And Chitanya K, can we expect to see AP increase their water resistance to a standard 100 in the Royal Oak this year? I hope so, but I don't think it will happen because I think they have deliberately retained 100 meters as a distinguishing feature of the offshores, and I don't think they want a reason for you to further backlist the already exhaustively weightlisted 15500 and I do think they want to kind of steer you towards the overseas because I know those don't do quite as well as the standard Royal Oaks. We got a question from, well, a salutation from William Burdeen from Valparaiso, Indiana. Jim Millett from the UK noting we have a few Brits in the chat. All right, Blancpain does a double launch with the 50 Fathoms with a new bathyscaph. Now here's the thing, when Rolex launched the Submariner, the new Submariner in 2020, they did something they hadn't done before. They launched the Submariner date and the Submariner, that is the no date, at the same time. Now normally, they launch the date model first and the no date a few years later, but launching them both, they made them instantaneously available to order at retail. So, we have known the bathyscaph since 2013 as the more vintage inflected model in the 50 fathoms collection. Blancpain, however, just launched a new core 50 fathoms, say hello to reference 5010, that's the Automatique 42 in titanium. Why wait a model year when the two watches arguably appeal to different buyers? So no need to leave shoulder room for two different watches because they appeal to different tastes. Maximize the energy from two new launches rather than one, have that core model right there for people like me who want a modern luxury aesthetic, and then a new generation bathyscaph for people who want something a little bit more traditional. Could a new bathyscaph be coming, perhaps in the shape of last year's bronze gold 70th anniversary Act 3 limited edition? Well, because this is bronze gold and a limited series, I think it could stand as its own watch and remain exclusive and special for the people who stepped up and bought that edition, but I also think you could make a version of this in titanium or ceramic or steel that would be a fantastic regular production second generation bathyscaph. I also think there's room to make a few different case sizes because as we saw with the 38 millimeter reference 5100 bathyscaph, that opened up the door to people with a taste for traditionally sized watches and women who didn't want something tiny quartz and diamond encrusted. So I can see more room to build out a bathyscaph collection in the first year than in the standard 50 Fathoms collection where you want to come out with a 5010 and then later you want to do a chronograph and then after that some sort of calendar system. So, could a new bathyscaph be coming? Very much. 
Jumping into the box right here. Eli B is in the box and we've got David saying, nice, one of my first times catching the show live, we got Abdul from the Black Forest in Germany saying the white gold Daytona gets a diamond bezel and mother of pearl dial, and I'm looking forward to seeing that. Dave in Vienna staying up late with us talking about vintage. How would a newly launched 3970 or 3940 look? If you were the designer, how would you design it? Well, if I were doing a new 3970, I think the defining feature of that watch is that it's 36 millimeters in diameter. So I'm not sure that you could use the 29535 that is in the 5270. So you'd need a new movement at the very least. And I'm not sure that you can start with a watch and then build a movement to fit it. I think you need to design the movement first and then design the watch around it. So it could take a little bit more time than you think. We got Kristen joining in from Boston, Massachusetts, not far from where I went to school. And we've got Emacs saying Explorer 2 should be an RLX. I assume he means maybe in titanium. Vincent Lafoe, were Swatch Group brands participating in Watches and Wonders? Uh, generally not. No, um, we have, so I might be a little bit off base with Blancpain, but the fact that they've already been launching watches this year, you gotta remember that sometimes you don't need to be part of the show. Like Hublot and Zenith and Tag Heuer used to launch watches on their pirate ship across from the Beau Rivage every year during SIHH. They weren't part of the show, but they were definitely part of the event. What else is going on here? Randy S from South Carolina, and we got Mark Mortimer joining from Kent, England. First time follower, loving the output. Thank you so much, guys. Following this live, keep it going. Let's get this thing up to like 400 viewers. Okay, Longa. This event has traditionally been all about the Richemont brand since it was called SIHH. So Longa marks 30 years since its modern re-establishment. I would love to see a new Port La Marite Tourbillon. Critically, the Port La Marite Tourbillon is one of the few Longa models to reach Patek Rolex Journe levels of interest at all auction. And it is one of the first four modern day Longa models. It was a world premiere when it launched at Dresden Castle back in October of 1994. You had the Saxonia, the Arcade, the Longa One, and the Port La Marie Tourbillon. And it was a combination of a fusée and chain constant force device and a tourbillon with a power reserve indicator. These things together had never been done in a wristwatch. Right around 200 were made, though that's a bit debatable because every once in a while a variant no one knew about shows up, but right around 200 were made. And it was a collaboration with Audemars Piguet, Renault et Papy, because the then brand new Lanka manufacturer didn't yet have the skill set to make this in its entirety. So being a combination of AP and Lanka, I regard it even more highly. Could something like this be coming on a very limited basis to reclaim the podium position at the front of Lanka's collection, if only for a single model year? I would love to see that. Regardless, expect Longa to make a big deal about its 30th anniversary, and rightly so. The fact is they're coasting on the momentum of the Odysseus, but it's also revived interest in other watches. The Dodograph, the Zeitwerk, especially the limited editions, they have a lot more energy behind them now. And while you can still go in and probably buy any silver dial, yellow gold dress watch you want, Longa's got a lot more energy behind the brand and interest. This year, the spotlight will be on them. Three decades since the modern company was reestablished, arguably the most impressive of all resurrected brands in the modern era. Longa, impress me. This is your time. All right, jumping into the box, Mark S. Tim, what does Pour Le Marit mean? It was in Kaiser era Germany, a very high order of merit. Not necessarily military, but something that, for example, just about anyone at a high level of attainment in society could receive. It could be a scientist, it could be a statesman, it could be a soldier, but it was a high level order of merit during the Hohenzollern era of Germany. That's the best way to describe it. Something that would have been familiar to the original Langa family during the 19th century. Okay, so viewerist shots number two, I asked you answered. Kyle R and his 1916 bought Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaf, thank you for trusting our company, takes in the Florida Keys, one of my favorite places in the world. Rick R from the Midwest, a good friend of the brand, check out his perpetually Patek and collector conversations with us on this channel. He's got his Panerai Luminor Bitampo Lunarosa on holiday in Tam Kok, Vietnam. John D, 
piloted an overnight to Hong Kong with his Dan Reuter DR02 chronograph. It's what I'm wearing today. Thank you for forwarding that shot. We are Dan Reuter fanboys here. Chaitanya K, he's in the box now. He's on your screen. Lights up the night with his Rolex Sea Dweller 43. We've got Sorab P in his 1916 bought Cartier Tank America, walking with Enzo the dog. Once again, thank you for trusting our company guys. Wrist shots. Send them to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com, and you can see your wrist on my list. Okay, what else going on here? We got Ivar joining in. We've got Eduardo C saying 50 fathoms price 13,000 would blow the Submariner out of the water. It exists. It's called a recently pre-owned 50 fathoms but you can easily find them at that price with warranty remaining. Horatio says, Tim, how cool do you think a true Gondolo comeback would be still finding the 5124G gorgeous? Especially that original version with the blackened white gold dial features and the salmon dial. Randy S saying, Nomos is crushing it lately. Interesting to see what they display. And Jim Millett saying, always great to see a Reuter. I'm wearing one right now. Okay, Abdul saying, one more day to know which Rolex models will cost more due to being discontinued. Doesn't always work that way. Cellini princes are still cheap. Okay, guys, one watch collections, pros and cons of just one watch. We did the clickbait topic, now we're doing the watch nerd topic. I feel this question constantly, and I'm not sure whether it's practical or comical. Here's why. The kind of watch diehards pondering the one watch question tend to be exactly the people who can't live with just one watch. And it's like Jay Leno pondering which one of his nearly 200 cars and 200 motorcycles he would keep if he could only keep one. Sure, Jay, sure. So, that said, I'm exactly the kind of guy who would actually wear one watch long term. I wore my Zin EZM 1.1 almost exclusively for over four years, and had it not been for something I take as a very dear, personal, and important cause, it would still be on my wrist today. Even then, most of you know me by the Dan Reuter that I wear almost exclusively despite having a couple of different watches. So this does speak to me as a topic. So what is the ultimate one watch collection? Let's consider the options, their merits, and reasons why you might look elsewhere. So the good and the bad for each starting with the Zenith Pilot Doublematic. Now, if you've watched my reviews channel, you know what I think of this watch. From its launch in 2012, I've been recommending this watch as a do-it-all bargain. From a practical standpoint, it's a bit of a miracle that all of the following can be had on this watch used for under $10,000. First, it is an El Primero high beat column wheel chronograph movement. 50 hour power reserve, 10 beats per second from the Zenith manufacturer in Le Loc. It has a grand dot with quick set and flush discs, a feather in the cap of any double digit date. It has an alarm with both a color changing power reserve indicator and an on off toggle so you can disable it when you want. There's a Louis Cotier style world time display with all of the 24 principal time zones of the world. And if you look right there, it doesn't show you the most interesting feature of the dial. It actually has solid block Luminova numerals. That is, they are three dimensional, like on an FP Journe line sport which is very, very cool to see, and the hands are beautifully brushed for a matte look. This is a superb watch, and again, it is a full case of watches in terms of the things it can do in a single 45 millimeter steel canister. So where does this Zenith fall short? Well, first, it's too huge. That's it on my wrist. I can't pull this off. I would love to, because if I could, I'd own it already. 45 millimeters in diameter and 52 millimeters lug to lug means only big boys get to play. Now, 50 meter water resistance is fine for a pilot's watch, and this is ostensibly a pilot's watch, but it's not quite enough for an all-arounder. I wouldn't swim with a 50 meter watch that doesn't have screw down crowns, and this one doesn't. And rarity. This is a double-edged sword. It's an asset to owners, but can be a bit of a headache to shoppers because these can be hard to find. But that's my thoughts on the Pilot Doublematic. If you've got the wrist for it, there are almost no drawbacks, and you've got just about no excuses not to add this thing to your collection.
Okay, we got MLMJ saying for him, one watch Zenith A385 Revival. Keeping watch UK, one watch isn't a collection, but my, go go my vote goes to Explorer or Sub. And then Abdul saying, if you buy watches to celebrate an event, how can you sell them all for only one watch? Very hard for me. Crazy Watch joining in from Luxembourg, the homeland of the Schleck brothers in cycling, saying, thank you, Tim, for our dream wish list. Andrew T saying, would love to get this Zenith, but it's just too big for me. You and me both, brother. And John Anderson, the ultimate one watch, Longa One Perpetual in Platinum. Well, we're not done here. Okay. Blancpain Bathyscaphe Gray Ceramic. Now, this came out in 2017, 43 millimeters, lightweight ceramic, sapphire, front and back, nearly impervious to scratches, so it's very light due to the material it's made of, but it's also almost completely immune to the kind of marks that either disfigure our watches or require us to refinish them, both of which I hate. Now, it fits well due to its size. It's a bit smaller than the reference 5015. This is the reference 5000 in ceramic, and the lightness makes it fit even better on my small wrist. So my wrist is 16 centimeters, game on. Mechanically, it is identical to the 5015. Caliber 1315, present and correct. We got five days of power reserve, anti-magnetic, shock resistant, well known to keep chronometer grade time and better. The five day reserve with three barrels is really something special in the dive watch space. The watch itself has a 120 click bezel and it's 300 meters just like the 5015. Plus this movement is extensively decorated. Black polished screws, snailing on the bridges, mile wide anglage, beveled jewel sinks. We've got solarization on the ratchet wheel and the crown wheel. It is a very good looking movement. Fantastic buys are to be had pre-owned. We had a comment a few minutes ago about a $13,000 50 fathoms. Well, fantastic buys to be had pre-owned on this one. If you go over to Chrono24, you'll be able to buy this watch anywhere between about eleven dollars and $13,000. Now, dive watches generally pack durability, style, plus the timing utility of a diving bezel. I often find a dive bezel is more practical and readable than a chronograph, plus you don't get the downstream service costs of a chronograph. For me, this could very easily be the one watch. Everything from ergos to rare durability, practicality, utility, finish, spec, and a high horology brand to boot. This thing has everything going for it, but it's not perfect. So where does the bathyscaphe fall short? Well, many will claim it's not the core model, and they're right. If you want the definitive 50 fathoms, that is now the reference 5010. If you want the core model, the one, the only, the direct heir to the 1953 original, you're looking at it, and it's not the bathyscaphe. Also, ceramic has handling limitations. Most people will never approach those limits, but metal dents, ceramic fractures, and I've seen every kind of ceramic watch damaged beyond repair. If you're not the type to break or fracture sapphire crystals on your existing watches, you probably have nothing to worry about. But all the same, if you're a guy who wears his watches hard, you might want to consider metal over ceramic, which is a reason to get the standard bathyscaphe, not the ceramic one. Also, there's no bracelet option as one would find on the metal versions of the bathyscaphe. So if a bracelet's important to you, I would stay away from the gray ceramic or any ceramic bathyscaphe. Plus, I will say this, the core model 5010 now actually fits better than the 43 millimeter bathyscaphe. So it used to be the core was 45, now it's 42. The bathy at 43 is maybe just a little bit behind the times. I feel if the core watch is now 42, the bath the scaff has got to be like 40, especially since it's the more vintage inspired of the 50 Fathoms. 40 seems better. Okay, guys, Patek Philippe. This is where things get really interesting because I've shouted this watch out. If you've got the budget, the Nautilus Travel Time Chronograph 5990 is absolutely uncompromised. It is superbly wearable, although in theory it goes after the Royal Oak Offshore. It's only 40.5 millimeters and at 12.8 millimeters thick, it's only about half a millimeter thicker than either a standard 5980 Nautilus Chronograph or a Rolex Daytona. So we're talking super slim for what's inside. It has unrivaled resale value. If you buy it at a retail price of $68,930, that's the retail price of this in steel right now. You can go out and turn it for six 
figures. Now, Patek Philippe is going to dump on you if you do and you get caught, but the fact remains, even if you sell it three, four, five years later, when Patek is generally considered to be a little bit more cool about these things, you're going to make a lot of money. So if you can buy this new and be the first owner, you literally cannot lose. This is also a family-owned brand with integrity that stands behind its products. And while every once in a while that can result in cynicism and abuses, that is the case with Audemars Piguet, the Audemars family is not nearly as hands-on as the Stern family is in its stewardship of the brand. And the Sterns are not just interested in making money. They're interested in preserving the value and integrity of the Patek Philippe brand. They've done things like discontinue their most popular watch. For example, at Audemars Piguet, they've opened the floodgates. Patek, in comparison, discontinued the 5711. So this is a company that will always have your back. Flyback chronograph and travel time. You've got both of them in one watch with a date. What more could you want from a complication standpoint? Both are very practical. I would also say finish is excellent inside and out. Although this caliber 28520 is not considered to be one of the most artisanal Patek movements, there is a baseline of hand finishing you find on every Patek caliber that ensures you are getting your money's worth and a human being touched every part that you're looking at. It's also anti-magnetic, reasonably shock resistant, and a full 120 meters water resistant. So this is truly a one watch only. It's also very well loomed. As you can see, there is plenty of luminescence on the dial. And because both of the hour hands are in a 12 hour format, you can superimpose them to clean up the dial when you don't need the second time zone. So where does this Patek 5990 fall short? Well, it simply attracts too much attention for better and for worse. It's nearly impossible to obtain at dealer retail and the lines are long. Used market prices are extraordinary and prohibitive. The dial is dead when the chronograph's not running. It doesn't have a seconds display. As with all watches of this class, it's a magnet for dents, scratches, and scuffs. And you could probably buy a Zin that does all the same stuff for under five grand. So that's your reality check option. Okay, viewer wrist shots number three. Max S of Charlotte, North Carolina is in Moab, Utah with the latest Rolex Submariner green bezel. Let's take a look at Max S. Anders H shares a his and a hers with his Omega Constellation Globemaster and Longines Grand Classique. We have Danny K of Switzerland who is in Lucerne with his Omega Seamaster GMT at the River Rus. We have Soma R. Hits the road with watches and wheels, his Lexus LS460, which he loves, and I adore. Lexus, great cars. And the Grand Seiko GMT SBGJ203, the Lexus of GMTs. We have Jesse S., who takes a pause in Salt Lake City with his vintage Hoyer quartz diver and a daiquiri. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, one watch collections, pros and cons. Let's continue our journey through the thoroughly practical and possibly unserious business of pretending that we can stop at just one watch. Since we took a look at the travel time chronograph, let's investigate another practical permutation, the Ulysse Norden El Toro. Launched back in 2010, this rarely seen GMT and perpetual calendar does it all. Rose gold can be had if you want a little bit more warmth. The other one is platinum. Cool brand. Ulysse Norden with huge upside now that it is independently owned once again, a true manufacturer and run and owned by management. Bi-directional perpetual calendar. This mechanism, it is Ludwig Oxlund's magnum opus studied while restoring clocks for the Vatican. This system implemented in wristwatches can be set in both directions. The GMT feature is a true 24 hour display with travel time pushers like the Patek. The Movement is automatic winding, COSC certified, and courtesy of a screw down crown, protected to 100 meters, so you can swim with this watch. There's plenty of loom, a ceramic bezel to block dents. This is a 500 piece limited edition, and you have your choice of rubber or alligator straps with a white gold clasp. Prices are reasonable pre-owned. This is a watch that really can do it all and do it all with capability in every dimension. So where does the El Toro fall short? 
Well, size is a bit of an issue due to the 43 millimeter diameter and the integral extended lug. So if we can show the size, it is a big watch and you can see it on my wrist. It does eat up my whole forearm. I'll let you decide whether that fits, but be forewarned, you're looking at 16 centimeters. And I would say that idiosyncratic style is maybe a drawback. It really depends on how you feel about those integrated lugs and this period when you and catered heavily to Eastern European tastes that don't necessarily travel. Despite versatility, the QP system on this watch still has a danger zone at night, so you don't want to set it in the middle of the night. And while it's COSC certified, and this is true, it is a COSC chronometer, it lacks hacking seconds for precise syncing. Anecdotally, many of them on the market seem to have been put away for years and not serviced, so that's something to look for if you do buy one of these used. Okay, how about a dress watch, guys? We've been looking at a lot of sports watch and sporty watches. Well, how about we get a small independent brand into the mix? How about Garrick of Norfolk, England? The new S7 is the right dress watch for our times. 38 millimeters steel, highly customizable to suit the owner. Now, gold is available, but I think you'd prefer steel, if nothing but the durability and the purist's choice. Hands can be swapped, so you have your choices there. Dial, design, and color are custom. Pricing starts at 8229 but if you're watching this, you're gonna wanna go with the full engine turned dial, because you're one of my homeboys in this chat. You guys want all of the bells and whistles. And you want the display case back. That'll be 10761 fully customized with a display back. Now, Garrick has a notable waiting list, but communication from the brand is excellent throughout the process. They won't leave you hanging. You'll get access to a portal so you can see the progress of your watch. Pent-up demand for these protects the resale value, and I can vouch for the people running the company. They are all above board and real enthusiasts. Steel used here is 904L, uniquely anti-corrosive and seldom seen outside of Rolex. And this dress watch is shockingly water resistant to 100 meters. So there's a versatility here you might not expect. Garrick quotes plus five seconds per day for its vintage Unitas 6425 movement that they use, which is outstanding because most brands don't quote any kind of accuracy promise. So where was the Garrick S7 in terms of falling short? Well, this is a crowded space. You've got Felipe Pikulik, you've got Sartori Villard, Stefan Kudoka, the Habrings, Torsti Lina, and many others who play in the eight to $18,000 space with adaptations of various Unitas, Valju, and other customer architectures. Not a knock on the Garrick specifically, just that you've got choices. The optional display back case back, the fact that it's not basically standard, indicates that Garrick isn't quite as proud of its Unitas 6425 as it is of this more elaborately decorated and in-house fabricated customized caliber. This is Unitas based, but a 6498, and as you can see, it is a lot more elaborate than the 6425 in the S7. And if you're watching this show, you're probably better off getting that S6 that you're looking at, because I know your, your movement, guys. Now, the Garrick 41 millimeter S6 you're looking at right there is a bit larger, much more elaborately decorated, more customizable, and actually costs a few thousand less than the S7, so it might be a win-win-win. Garrick volumes too, and this isn't necessarily a negative, but they are low. S7 one-year production slots amounted to maybe 15 watches the first year, so a certain amount of motivation and patience is required. That said, again, communication from the brand throughout is excellent. Now, we're running out of time, so let's see. What have we got here? Real quick, how about a calendar chronograph? Well, Patek is known for them, but the 2000 Vacheron Malta Perpetual Calendar Chronograph, 39 millimeters in diameter, only 47 millimeters lug to lug for excellent fit on a small wrist. The lugs are welded on, artisanally crafted, sculpted with stunning profiles. Caliber 1141 QP is Lemania based, the same caliber 2310 base as the Patek 3970 and 5970. It lives under a hinged hunter case back like a pocket watch. Dial balance is excellent and rivals the Patek. Half frosted hands are a gem and easy to read against the white base. Look at the market for these. Fifty to $60,000? for a Holy Trinity Perpetual Calendar Chronograph in precious metal. Then check out the market for the 5970 from Patek and consider what a stunning opportunity the malt is. Now there is a platinum version that was worn by Colin Farrell in the Miami Vice movie, but I actually like the warmth and color of the standard yellow malt. Where does the malt fall short? 
Well, as with most dress watches, water resistance is negligible. You need to take it off and stow it or hide it if you're gonna take the plunge. Ultimately, if you view, if you view your watch as a pure investment, just consider the 5970 or 3970. Oddly, VC chronographs from the 90s and 2000s generally don't carry the Geneva Hallmark. Now, finishing here is impeccable, unimpeachable, awesome. But if you want the Geneva Hallmark, I know it's important to some, it's not actually here. Also, Vacheron abandoned this version of the malt in favor of an all tonneau series. That leaves the 47112 right here as a bit of an orphan relative to the current malt offerings. The watch is also fairly squat, proportionally chunky, rather than purely graceful, but I consider that part of its charm. Screw it, I love this malt, and you should too. Okay, our final wrist shots. Let's jump to the end right here, Nick. Let's go to wrist shots number four. Brian P. indulges us with a tag and a jag. Glass box Carrera caliber 18 and Jaguar XK8. Jeb B. captures a stirring shot with his Chopard Time Traveler 1 and the U.S. flag. Ryan M. of the U.K. showcases his Seiko 5 Sports Field GMT with custom strap. Jake W. is ready to tell time on road and off with his Islander Rangemaster and Jeep. And Tom B. takes us home from Geneva on the quay with a 1960 Cadillac, a car after my own heart. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. Nick, thank you so much. You did a great job tonight. Thanks to all of you for making this a blockbuster episode. Be well, have fun. We're going to be covering watches and wonders in real time, so stay tuned to the channel. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.